Good evening. A few announcements before we get started. As many of y'all know, as we talked about this morning, uh, Mr. David Nance is here to, to talk to us about his work in India. And uh, just a couple announcements before we get started. Jeanette and David Barnes, of course, they're both uh, uh, dealing with health issues. David's got his surgery the 28th. Uh, it says, uh, Warner Roby, uh, a friend of Kenny Dorch, has cancer, which we've added him to the prayer list. Uh, Lindsay, the Villamore family, all of them except for Joey are sick. Mr. Howell's not feeling well. But we did get some good news. Uh, Mr. Wilton got a great report that he is cancer-free. So, of course, we're very excited about that. Um, keep in mind that Jeff is still sick, not doing well. So check on him. We know he takes care of his mom a lot, too. So Jeff and Nancy both, uh, be sure to check on them and make sure they're doing well or getting better at least here soon. And then another note from that was not in this morning, but uh, Sarah Nolan had her wisdom teeth taken out, which is no fun at all. So be praying for her, checking on her. Maybe bring her some ice cream if you're nearby. I hear that helps. Um, I think that's it. I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Billy. Van, you want to get the opening prayer? Always easy. Prayer number 348. 348. And then we'll have our first prayer in the, uh, for the evening. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall when I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend and trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them o'er and o'er. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends a harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I trust him when life's bleeding day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, is my friend. Let us pray. Most loving and kind Heavenly Father, we are again thankful for the opportunity to come together, to join together as those of a like precious faith and offer praise and worship to you. Father, we ask that you be with us through this evening, that you help us to learn, that you help us to apply what is learned so that we may be an impact to the community around us. Father, we ask your blessings on each and every member of this congregation, that you give each and every one of us the talents and abilities to go out and to spread your gospel and to do the things that need to be done to make others want to learn about you and your son and your love and draw near and become a child of God and obey the gospel of Christ. Father, we ask your blessings upon Brother Terrence and his family, and also we ask your blessings upon Brother Nance and the work that he is engaged in and that you let it be fruitful. And Father, we ask that you be with those of our number who are sick be with those who are having surgeries. We're especially mindful of Brother David Barnes. Father, we ask that you be with those of our number who are quietly and dealing with trials and tribulations of life, that you give them the endurance that they need, that you give them the things that they need to be able to 
deal with what they're going through and do so in a manner that glorifies you and shows them to be mature Christians and helps them to come through on the other side a, a stronger child of God and closer to you. Father, we know that we are flawed. We know that we're imperfect. And Father, we're thankful to you for your love in spite of our flaws. And we're thankful to the love that you've shown to us through the sending of your Son that he may walk among us, teach us, take on flesh, and lower himself from that exalted position in heaven with you. And then ultimately, once he arrived on earth, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. Father, we ask humbly that you forgive us of our sins. We're thankful that you have given us a way that we might receive redemption through the blood of your Son. Father, we ask that you grant us the wisdom to know when we have committed transgressions against you. And we ask humbly that you give us the, the humility to drop down on a knee and come to you in this avenue of prayer before your throne and ask for your forgiveness. Again, Father, go with us through this service. Again, thank you for all of the blessings of life that you've so generously bestowed upon us. These things we humbly pray in your Son's blessed name. Amen.
So considering he's been doing it for about as long as I've been alive, I figure it's foolish for me to say very much in the way of introduction. So we'll go ahead and bring him on up here. Uh, turn it over to Brother Nance. to be here glad to be back I mean it's been a little while and uh, I'm just excited to be back that's a fact I, uh, I really appreciate all the fellowship that we've had over all these years and uh, if you don't mind I'll conduct this down here we'll uh, do it as a class that way you can talk and if you have a question a thought uh, anything on your mind you've been involved in this work for so many years that I know that you may have had thoughts or ideas you know well I wonder about this or I wonder about that and uh, you know that's probably not in my presentation and so <laughs> if you have a thought if you have an idea please just speak up and we'll carry the conversation in that direction for a little while if that's all right with you okay now you know I have never been introduced that way Terrence well, ever since I was a Christian, he's been doing this. And ever since I've been alive, he was doing that, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, it it kind of makes me feel a little bit on the older side. But that's okay. I was up at Green Plain this morning. You probably know where that is, up just south of Murray and all that. Got a text uh, just before church started, actually, about the time I you know, was standing here waiting for somebody else to come in and... and uh, they said, hey, guess what? We found your iPad on our pulpit. <laughs> so uh, maybe the memory ain't what it once was. <laughs> anyway, uh, before I get started in this, uh, did you pass out those? Uh, yeah. Okay, if you would, please. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you very much for the support that you've been giving our work uh, and my work for all these years. I'm not going to say very much about it other than it's deeply, deeply appreciated that your support is. You've been helping us both as a congregation and individually. And so, uh, you know, uh, I just thank you very much. You know, the Lord's blessed us in a lot of ways. During COVID, I fully expected that, a con that the contributions to the work would, would, would be less. The reason was simple, because congregations weren't meeting. Churches, you know, weren't having their classes or anything else. And, uh, but the Lord blessed us, so during our COVID time, our contributions stayed absolutely level. And I thought that was a great blessing. But the other side is, after we've now started coming back and most congregations are pretty much doing the same kinds of work that they were doing beforehand, but inflation has hit. Uh, and we all know how tough that has been. Well, since inflation has hit, our contributions have kind of dived down a little bit. So I'm going to ask you, if you can, to please uh, figure out a way, maybe if you can help us a little bit more. It'll be very helpful. And particularly, you know, a lot of the work that we've done uh, over the years is with uh, orphans and with widows over there. Um, and, you know, as much as inflation hurts us, you know, you go and you, you, you know, pay twice the amount you used to for eggs, and you know, that gives us a good room to complain. But on the other, high, other side, you know, we still eat our eggs. Um, but over in India, for these orphans and these widows that we help, uh, help with, if their prices of eggs double, that means they eat half the eggs. And so it really makes a difference. And that's about all I'm going to say about that. And so uh, uh, before I go into the rest of my presentation, does anybody have a question or a comment or something you'd like me to, to deal with? Do you have to deal with people? Do I have to deal with people like you? I changed my underwear. Uh, yeah, what we have here is a lot different than what they have there. The government control of the Christians in India is, is pressure in a lot of different ways. Uh, but most of the pressure against uh, my work in India is against me personally. Uh, they don't like Americans coming over there uh, and doing the work that we do. So I go on a tourist visa. Almost all the people I know that do this kind of work do work on a tourist visa. And so that means I have to basically act like a tourist. Um, and, you know, acting like a tourist isn't a hard thing to do. It just means, you know, that, well, one of my best friends is this. 
because as I pass a cemetery, as I pass a fort, as I pass a temple, whatever else, just stop, you know, take a picture and, you know, read the sign and, and kind of go on from there. And they ask, well, where have you been? And so I say, I've been here, here, and here. I'll give you an example of what, what I mean by that. One time I was doing an exit interview on leaving India. When you fly in, you have immigration that you have to go through when you land. But you also have immigration you have to go through when you leave. See, unlike America, Indians are very, very serious about their immigration laws. In fact, most countries are. Uh, so they interview us while we're coming in, interview us when we leave. And so he says to me, he says, well, where'd you go? And I told him, I don't know, three or four places. He said, okay, yeah, he's looking at a computer screen. He says, yeah, okay, All right, yeah, you went here, what'd you see, what'd you see, what'd you see? Then he looks at this computer screen some more and he says, and I noticed you went here and here and here and here and said, now what'd you see there? See, so, you know, I have to be able to answer those questions. One of the other things that we do is we travel a lot. That's what tourists do. Tourists don't usually, you know, light in one place, uh, you know, for all that long. So we're, you know, three or four days here, five days there, two or three days here. Uh, that's what a tourist does. Uh, one of the other things is we used to not stay in hotels. We used to stay in, in brethren's homes and things like that. We can't do that anymore. Uh, they, that's how they track us. Is, you know, everywhere we go, we have to present the passport. It's photographed. It's given to the local police. And then the local police enter it into the computers. And you know, so that's how they know where we are. Give you an example of why that's, uh, you know, how we have to deal with that is this. Let's suppose that I was to come to Dover here and say, you know, have a gospel meeting for three, four days. And I might would stay with one of you, okay? Not an unusual thing. You would be required to take my passport to the police and, you know, have, identify me as being here. But if you have two neighbors, one on each side, both of them have better go to the police and tell me you are in, hosting me. Because, you know, if they don't go, they get dinged by the police. And if you don't report me, you get dinged by the police. So, you see, that's kind of what we have to deal with. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let me suggest something to you, though. You may remember, I'm sure you do, Joseph in, in uh, the book of Genesis, his brothers, what did they do to him? Sold him into slavery, absolutely so. Now you remember, he became the second in command in Pharaoh. The whole of Jacob's family moved down there. He moved him in, you know, en masse to everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. He revealed himself to them, and boy, they were scared about that. When Jacob died in chapter 50 of Genesis, the brothers came to Joseph and asked him something. Do you remember what it was? They said, are you going to take vengeance on us? He said, because our father's dead. And just, they want you, we want you to know that, that dad would not appreciate it if you took vengeance on us. Well, Joseph, do you remember his response? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And that's exactly how I feel about these restrictions that I have to deal with and that Americans have to deal with to do the mission work in India. Because they intend to slow down our work by doing this. And it isn't happening. In fact, I think our work in India is generally among the strongest uh, works in the world uh, that the Churches of Christ are doing mission-wide. I mean, worldwide mission. Here's why. In most mission fields, you have a preacher and his family or whatever, they go in, they go in for six months, they go in for six years, they go in for 60 years, they go in for however long they do, and, and they may work a little around here, look a little around there, but most of the time they're pretty much right in, in a particular location and area. And that's good. That really does help an awful lot, okay? Those missions are very good. I don't want you to hear anything other than that. But... The development of leadership skills and Bible class teachers when the local missionary or the foreign missionary is in a located place all the time or most of the time, the development of these leaders and the development of these teachers is very slow. Now you can just imagine what it is. Let's suppose you've never taught a Bible class and, uh, you know, Terrence is here and, and he says, listen, I think I need a day off. Why don't you teach the Bible class? And you've never done it. 
And he says, listen, I know you can do this. I know you can do this. What's going through your heart? <laughs> you know? That's, I mean, that's what happened to me the first time. First time I got up with 12 pages, single typewritten, single space typewritten sermon. I'd done it 15 times. I'd read it out loud. And, and it was 26 minutes long. When I got up there and actually did it, it was 10 minutes long. <laughs> well, think about what happens now in India. We can't stay there. In any one place, we can't stay long. So what does that force us to do? That forces us to develop and train local leadership. That's what it does. Local evangelists, local preachers, local teachers, local elders. You see? And that is what we need to do. Now, one of the things about India, other, that's also different from other places that I can go into in just a minute, is there are more people there than you can shake a stick at. You can repeat this process just, I mean, on and on and on and on because there's no end to the supply of, of new people and places for new congregations. Does that get to your point? But, but you didn't know you asked all that, did you? Any other thoughts or ideas? Well, technically, I can stay 180 days out of 365. But um, I never do that because what tourists does, they don't. So usually I end up staying three weeks, six weeks. Uh, the longest I've ever stayed is 12 weeks at any one time. Uh, and, you know, go once a year, go twice a year, sometimes three times a year. But, again, uh, it, it, it's uh, scattered and it's random almost. In their eyes, it's scattered and random. I mean, I know what I'm trying to plan, but, but they don't. And so does that kind of get to your... Okay. So am I correct in understanding you could not say what you were there for in terms of the church where you were? Yeah, are you... He, he, He's asking, asking uh, could I not say, uh, could I, what would happen if I did say? How about that? What if I, when I first started going to India, we used to could be able to say, hey, yeah, I'm going over here to work with this children's home. I'm going over here to teach at this school. I could do that kind of stuff. And the Indian brother, the Indian authorities, yep, fine, no problem. But about, oh, eight, eight to ten years ago, the Indian government changed and they elected what I call radical Hindus. And they started putting top-down pressure. And the way they ding me is they say, your activities are not the activities of a tourist. So we're going to suspend your tourist visa. And so that's what they do. You're right. I do, I do not tell them what I do. Now, I, I don't lie to them. I, they say, what are you going to do? And I say, I'm going to go see this and go see that and go see this and go see that. And I do. But that's not all I do. <laughs> It is. I get asked. They know. Can you just shut it off now? No, well, it's, it's it, you know, uh, one of the guys I trained with when I was first doing my work in India, uh, he's passed away since then, uh, uh, Ron Clayton. He was very adamant asking every congregation, don't put our name in your bulletin. Don't put our stuff, you know, when I come and make a presentation, don't put it on Facebook or any of those other places. I've got a rather opposite thing. If they want to find me, they're going to. I mean, if they really want to, they're, gonna, they're going to. Uh, but I just stick to here's what I do. Here's what I am doing. Here's what I'm doing. And they ask me, you know, what, what is you know, my life over here like? I tell them what I am. I tell them who I am. Uh, it's all very clean and above board that way. Um, if they actually went in to start really looking at what you're talking about, there's no way to hide it. Not really. Uh, and they would ding me. The trick is, I don't give them a reason to look. Does that make sense? So you tell them that you're a minister here in the States? If they ask me what I do for a living, yeah. yeah. I, I, in fact, I usually tell them I am a teacher because that is what I do. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, five nights a week in a gospel meeting or whatever it is, what am I doing? I am teaching. And so uh, they also know that I work with Christians over there. They know I visit the churches. Uh, but that's all fine because what tourist isn't going to go and ignore their own religion? What tourist is going to, you know, show up and not worship? So you see that part of it's also open. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Any other thoughts or ideas? It kind of sounds like it's almost this 
this strategy of being as transparent as you can be to not be suspicious without being alert about what you're doing to sort of... Yeah, that. that's pretty much it. I think of it being James, James Bond, 007, you know. <laughs> I actually tell you the truth, I got the idea that I wanted to be a missionary back in about 1980 when a guy named Bob Hare was a missionary to Eastern Europe and to Russia came to the school of preaching and made a presentation. And what was, those of you who remembered, what was Russia like then? What was the Iron Curtain like? You would go in and they would literally strip search you. They would go in and they would have a car that they had rented to, to take on the trip. And uh, the, they'd cross into the border and the guards would literally pull the seats out of the cars and everything else. And of course they'd put them back in, but they'd put them back in with microphones. You see. And so this kind of thing has kind of been in the back of my mind as, uh, well, it's... It's what needs to be done. And I find it actually thrilling. <laughs> David, I would like to point out that while you may feel like James Bond, the villains in those movies typically wear what you wear. Thank you. <laughs> now seriously, it's not, it's not so serious, obviously, as that. It's not as serious as what Bob Hare and, and some of the others like that used to do. Uh, the only thing that'll happen to me is I'll get my visa dinged and then I can't get back in, um, you know, which is obviously would be a terrible blow for me. But on the other hand, that's, you know, in the, the full scale of life, that's not so terrible. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, let me kind of get back. Uh, any other thoughts or ideas? Pardon? Uh, their language, they have, uh, well, let me just go ahead here. I'm just going to skip some things here. And I'm going to show you what attends your language here. I mean, this map right here. Okay? Now, uh, you, all those different colors are different languages. Now, for instance, now you have, for instance, you have green over here and you have green over here. The, the color is not important. That's not saying it's the same language here and the same language here and the same language here. That's not what that's saying. What that's saying is it's just different from the ones around it. So the colors change just so you can see the borders a bit easier. But there are 17 official languages in India, which means you can go and vote in 17 languages. You can go have a driver's license in 17 languages. You go to road signs. You can tell when you go from one area to another where the road signs change. They, are, they have, some of them are in some English. A lot of them are in some English, uh, but then a lot of them are in language A and then language B. And then you move a few, you know, miles down the road and now it's language B and language C. You see. So, does that get your question? <laughs> The result of this is that I don't speak Indian. Uh, if I were working in a uh, place uh, that had one, maybe two main languages, you know, China with the Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, Japanese, uh, French, German, Spanish, whatever it was. If I were working in a place like that, particularly haven't been there as long as I have been, I absolutely would have spent a lot of time trying to learn the language and get reasonably fluent in that language. That's only reasonable for what I do. But I can't even remember how to say hello this many different ways. And so I don't even attempt, other than just a few things, we use translators everywhere we go. Now there is one thing I can teach you in Indian, it's this. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> everywhere you go, that's all you got to do, you know. <laughs> and they'll point it out. Um, this also has a, a, a different side to your question. The languages you know that Indians speak English, right? But you also know when was the last time that, that you called for tech support or, or product support or whatever and you talked to somebody in India? <laughs> you know, you're, take, you're talking English and they're talking English and it's, you know, it's not working. Part of the reason for that is because the way English is working over there. They have English as a bridge language. There is no majority language in India, none. And so you go from different places in India and they've got to be able to talk to each other, don't they? Well, sure they do. They've got to be able to talk to each other. 
uh, you know, even newspapers can't print in all these different languages, so they have English language newspapers that are, have a very high circulation. But here's what happens, is that their English is a bridge language so that they can go to the next town and they can buy their food or they can, you know, talk to their brother-in-law or they can, you know, if you want to talk to your brother-in-law. Um, they've got all kinds of, of little conversations that English is good for, okay? But their English is not at a high level. Think of this, as I think of in uh, the United States, do you all still here in Stewart County say the Pledge of Allegiance in your schools? Okay, yeah. Well, I did when I was a kid, and a thousand times, I can't remember the number, of course, I pledge allegiance to the flag and so on and so forth, right? Now, you, you know, any second grade kid can say that. And they can say it, if anything. And a second grader can talk about a lot of things, can't they? In fact, sometimes you'd wish, okay, enough, enough, enough. You know, they'll talk about a lot of things. But what they can't do is they can't talk about high-level concepts. They just haven't got the, the training for it yet. So when you were to ask, a, say, a second grader or a third grader, you say, what does it mean when you say, I pledge? And they're going to look at you. They don't know. And then you say, if you find one who, who knows what pledge is, you're going to say, okay, well, you know what pledge is. That's good. Uh, tell me what it means when you say, I pledge allegiance. When's the last time you used that word? You see. Well, he's, now, now the kid's lost. And if, I can remember this, when I was about 12 years old, I don't remember exactly my age, but I can remember for more than a few years of my growing up, I used to wonder, what is this I pledge allegiance to the flag about? I mean, what's that piece of decorated cloth got to do with anything I'm saying? Well, I understand it now, of course. But I didn't understand it all those years that I was saying it, even though I was fluent in the English language as, as much as a kid can be. That's the way their English is. So when you and I start going and talking about these high-level ideas, for instance, you start talking about uh, covenants, start talking about propitiation and, and atonement, you start talking about, uh, you know, holiness and righteousness, godliness. You start talking about all of the moral things that go on. You start talking about elders, and, and you, you need to talk about the, the biblical word for elders and presbyters and, and pastors and things like that. You start talking about a lot of these concepts that we talk about as Christians that are important to our Christian life, they are just falling, they don't have the words for it. They just don't have the words for it. So we use translators. Does that kind of get more to your point? Again, maybe more than what you asked. <laughs> Any other thoughts or ideas? Well, I could go back over the next day. As long as I'm within that 180 days per year limit, um, you know, but I don't. I usually wait three, four, five months, something like that. Um, you know, again, because I'm acting like a tourist. Do you take uh, out of the good work of third? Oh, yes. The example of uh, men of women cannot eat good hard over. Yeah, we teach them all about anything you would think we. Yeah, anything you would think we would want to teach faithful Christians here is what we teach them there. Absolutely so. And in fact, this is interesting to me is one of the one of the things about India that is so different than many other places is there are huge numbers of Hindus who are converting to Christianity. Now, when I say converting to Christianity. You know I'm using that term in a rather broad sense because the denominations are active over there too. Uh, in fact, I had it, I've already bypassed the, the statistic, but uh, over 14,000 Hindus per day are converting from Hinduism to Christ. Now, I want you to think about what that means for us. Where do the churches of Christ historically grow the fastest? And when churches of Christ historically grow the fastest where there is an area of a large number of Bible believers regardless of their denomination so that we can go in and show them how to be simple New Testament Christians that's our bread and butter it's what we've always done best and it's it's you know it's always where those kinds of people exist 
we can be successful. In India, if they're converting 14,000 plus per day, very large percentage of these people are becoming denominationalists. So what does that mean? That means they are becoming the field that we harvest. Now you think about this. If you're a Hindu, and you know, all of the Hindus know who Christ is, sort of. They know what the Bible is, sort of. You go into India and you see these temples with these you know, pagan statues all over these temples of the different gods. You're, you're not going to be unusual if you notice one that looks like Jesus or one that looks like Mary. They, that, so they're aware, okay? They don't know but they're much, but they're aware. Now, if you decide you're a Hindu and you want to start checking out Christianity then, how would you do it? Well, you, you wouldn't know where to start. You'd just start talking to a friend, a neighbor. You know, there's a church down the road. I think I'll go visit, you know, or something like that. You're just going to pick one. Isn't that right? No telling which one you're going to pick. It's just a roll of the dice. Well, when they teach you about Jesus and you are converted, then are you, are you happy and grateful about that? Sure, sure. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. That's exactly what these former Hindus, now denominational Christians, do. But here's the difference that's important. When they convert out of idolatry to Christianity, convert to the local denomination. Now, there are members there. They love it. They appreciate it. They appreciate the people and all of that. But their loyalty is not to the organization. The loyalty is not to the name or the denomination. The loyalty is to Jesus. The loyalty is to the Word of God. So when you and I then go in, or more importantly, when one of their, our Indian brothers goes in and starts showing them what simple New Testament Christianity is, you know, speak where the Bible speaks. Be silent where the Bible is silent. Call Bible things by Bible names. Do Bible things in Bible ways. When we just open the book like that, it's like they read it and they say, ah, yeah, let's do it that way. That's what happens, you see. Now, that's, that's important. This gets now back to, the, to the, the next thing I wanted to bring up along that same line, is this. One of the greatest ways that we are able to do it uh, is to do our conversion work is to have what we call denominational preachers seminars. Literally where we'll go into a town and we will invite all the local preachers of whatever denomination they are, we will invite them to a free seminar. And Indians are not dumb, they're not uneducated, uh, and the, their, their pastors, as it were, are, they're, they're, they're committed, they're, they're facing persecution, they want to be taught. And so the fact that we're not charging them anything, and we offer free lunch, uh, you know, <laughs> they will come. We'll have this for one day, two days, three days, you know, six hours a day. That's what we'll do. And in those seminars, we teach them everything you could possibly imagine, from what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, uh, what is the gospel, we'll teach them about, you know, Jesus, uh, we'll teach them about denominations, we'll teach them about premillennialism and the second coming of Christ, we'll teach them about the five, five acts of worship, we'll teach, you name it. That's what we'll cover with these preachers. And do you know what these preachers do? They sit there and stare at you, not with eyes amazed, but enraptured with, wow, I never saw that before. Why did no one ever show this to me before? And so it's not unusual. That usually starts the conversion process with these preachers, but when we convert one of these preachers, what happens? And that's exactly right. We end up converting the whole congregation. I'll give you an example of one experience I had, which is really a unique experience. I, didn't have, I haven't had this experience many times, but it's, it's not... The, the, what I'm sharing with you is not all that unusual for the whole setting. And I went into a Baptist church one time, was invited to speak uh, one night, and, and so I got up and I gave them a lesson uh, through a translator, of course. Uh, the Baptist preacher sitting over here, and I'm here, and I've got our translator here, and I teach them the five steps. You know, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, you repent, uh, you know, you confess Christ, you're baptized. Uh, you know, the five steps right there, boom, boom, boom. 
And I went through it, and I just, you know, the whole time, over and over, here's this finger, here's it. I'm getting the audience to speak it back. Okay, what's finger number one? Okay, what's finger number two? What's finger I'm doing it just like you would do to a middle school class to get them to, 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 to remember this stuff. Well, the Baptist preacher's sitting over here the whole time. Well, when I get finished, he says, well, I want to say something to the congregation. Well, what am I going to do? Say no? It's his church. So, sure. Well, I'm sitting back now. I don't understand anything he's saying. My translator isn't translating. But I know what he's saying because I'm watching him. And he is going over those five points like this in their language. And he is cementing it to them. And then he turns and he tells my translator who tells me, he says, we were Baptist church. We are no longer going to be a Baptist church. Now we are going to be churches of Christ. Wow, that's an evening to remember, isn't it? So that's the kind of thing that happens over there. And it's, it's one of the serendipities of the fact that we don't, as local missionaries, sit down in one place or two places and stay. We come and train leaders. And that's what we do. Any other ideas or thoughts? Five points. Nine. Five points. Uh, he, uh, I, that's not even my mother's Bible. <laughs> I went home. Mm -hmm. It was. There you go. So that's yeah, that's just absolutely uh, a great thing. Anybody else have any thoughts or ideas about the work? That's a great question. Yeah, do they stay with it? Do they stick with it? And there's a good reason. I get that question a lot, actually, because Americans, we're used to the American way. <coughs> Excuse me. The Americans, what happens in America is a person becomes a Christian. They're baptized into Christ. If you follow that person's spiritual growth, uh, on average, five years later, only one out of five of them is still faithful. 20% are faithful. 80% fall away. Now, why is that? Because in becoming a Christian in the United States is very easy to do. It doesn't necessarily change the work you do. It doesn't change the friends. It doesn't change how you get along with your relatives. It doesn't change, you know, your daily habits. It doesn't change where you shop. It doesn't change the clothes you wear. It doesn't change a lot of anything like this. When you're in India, however, it changes everything. And oftentimes it even changes their name. It's not unusual to, to find someone, an Indian Christian, whose name is a very biblical name, which if you actually find out what their real name is on their driver's license, you can't even pronounce it because it's an Indian name. They change their name even. They change their friends. They are, they are, they are persecuted. They are discriminated against deeply in India when they become Christians. Uh, one of the things is we work amongst the poorest of the poor. In India, the poorest of the poor get a stipend, a little stipend every month, so they can buy their, you know, some, some cooking, uh, some rice, some cooking oil, some natural gas to, uh, uh, you know, cook it with, and so on. When they, when a Hindu becomes a Christian and the local government finds out about it, they cut the stipend. Now you think that's not a sacrifice to make? It is. But here's the thing: two things about when they're converted. First is they don't do it on a whim. They are serious when they do it because they know of the persecution and they know of the discrimination that they're going to face. I'll give you an example of that. Let's suppose you have a public school over here. India is 70% Hindu. India is about 2, maybe 3% Christian, 13% Muslim, and you know the rest are in between in there. Well, everything in India is done on identity politics, and the thing that matters in Indian politics is not what sex you are, not how old you are, not whether you're LTGQI, XY, well, all the other alphabets. That's not important to them at all. What is important is your religion. And so they treat everybody on this religion quota. You know, if you're Hindu, you get this, and if you're not, you know, you get something else. So if you have a little school down here, this school has 100 seats in it. 
70 of those seats are going to be reserved for Hindu children. And nobody else can sit in them, even if they're empty. So Christians get two, maybe three seats out of that 100. Suppose you're a Hindu family and you convert to Christ. What happens to your kids in that school? Your kids have to now compete for those one or two or three seats. And if they don't, if it's not open, they can't go to school. Is that, is that discrimination? Hoy, oh yeah. And they know it. It's the same with their jobs. It's the same with their uh, you know, higher education. It's the same with a, a lot of things. Go into the hospital, in the emergency room. First question they ask is, what religion are you? If you're a Christian, you can sit over here for hours and hours when people with a lot less serious issues go right on in. So here's my point. <coughs> Excuse me. They know this before they're converted. And therefore, what happens is, in India, when someone is converted to Christ and you follow up with them about five years later, 80% of them are still faithful and only 20% have fallen away. Because in India, in America, when you're a Christian, you just slide back into the world, don't you? Just slide back in. Can't happen that way in India. In India, if you go back on your faith, it's, it's as sharp as being unbaptized you have to public declaration everybody knows it you see so there's no just falling away in that sense in India does that get to your your point I tell you it makes me feel good to be able to tell you that because you know we do a lot of work we, we put a lot of money we put a lot of time a lot of effort into this and it is so good to be able to do something that you don't have to redo okay well, it's about time for me to call it quits, and I didn't get you get, didn't get to much of my presentation here, but that's okay. That's okay. Any last question or thought? Well, thank you very much for letting me talk with you. Thank you for your support. And listen, you know, I, I really mean it the way I'm going to say this. I thank you for letting me be a part of your work, because that's exactly how I view our relationship. Well, let's see. Um, here's a songbook. At this point in our service, we always have an invitation song. And uh, what, 356? Is that right? Okay. Well, if you'll turn to 356, the reason we have an invitation song at all of our services is because if you're ready to become a Christian, we want to help you do that. If you are a Christian and you have sin in your life, then you need to repent of that, and we want to help. If you want us to pray with you about that sin, if you want us to pray for you about that sin, we want to help. And by the same token, if there's any situation in your life and you'd like us to pray with you about it or pray for you about it, we want to help. But the challenge is that no matter how much we want to help with these things, if we don't know, we can't. And so we have this invitation song at all of our services as a convenient way for you to be able to tell us how we can help. So if we can help you in any of these ways, please come forward, tell us how we can help while together we stand and sing this song. Jesus is is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today, bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed, he will not turn thee away. calling is tenderly calling today 
Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and away. Calling today. Calling today. Jesus is calling. His tenderly calling today. Now, all those in the audience that need to take the Lord's Supper, raise your hands. I'd be seated, please. This bows, we give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this bread. It represents the broken body of thy son as he hang on the cross. We pray that you be with each one tonight that partake of this. We pray that their mind goes back to that great sacrifice that was made for us, and they partake of this in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Raise your hands, please. give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup. It represents the blood that was shed on the cross for your son for us. Once again, we pray that you be with the ones to partake of this, that they do so in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn number 611 will be our closing song this evening. David, we appreciate you coming by and filling us in on, on your works. Uh, the world's wide open for works. And even on the homeland, it's open for works. We'll sing uh, first and last verse. Wilton, will you close us out at the end of this? Yes, sir. First and last verse, number 611. Y'all stand if you want to, please. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven, at the name of Jesus bow we falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth.